Hello, my name is Brock Hines, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute uh, Students Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members have access to exciting opportunities through their involvement with the Institute. This includes volunteering for evening programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and who would like to join, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's program presented by the Department of Military History and Command General Staff College at Fort Leavensworth. After the program, we'll have some time for the audience to ask a few questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able to stand. Please stand if you are able to and ask just one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster a civil and respectful discussion about important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your question with this in mind. Before we begin, I would like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones, and I'd also like to announce that we'll have a book program about women's veterans in American politics on November 15th at 2 p.m. More details can be found on our website, doleinstitute.org. And now, please join me in welcoming Director Dave Cotter. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, and thank you again for being here uh, in another one of our series on, the, on the, the periphery series that has been going on all this year. And it is my pleasure uh, and honor to introduce Professor Sean Kalick, who is today's, spe today's speaker. Uh, Sean occupies a very special place in the department. Uh, he is our master instructor. Uh, he is our senior academician, academician and is, uh, is responsible for developing the faculty uh, at the, in the Department of Military History. Uh, Sean's an accomplished scholar. He is, as you can see in the bio on your handout there, widely published. Uh, and he's, of course, uniquely uh, qualified to talk about this topic today, uh, as you can see by his, his, not too, his recent book. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Kalick. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you. To, uh... All right, thank you to Dave Cotter for letting me out of the building today, which is, I don't always get out of my office, so that's awesome. And uh, the Dole Institute for being back. I think this is my first time back since COVID, so it's really nice not to be in my home with a computer and seeing nobody. So awesome to see people again. So t today, part of the problem is how do we condense this into 45 minutes? That's the problem that I see. So, um, and the other problem is we have to talk about James Bond and all that other fun spy stuff, right? So I'll propose a way we kind of get through it in, in kind of a, an immediate fashion. And then if you have questions, we'll handle those at the end and uh, we'll go from there, right? So the reality is what we'll talk about is, is not specifically unique just spies, but the process of what happens during the Cold War. And we'll kind of start prior to the Cold War because the reality of of spying in the United States and the, and, and the Soviet Union, I would argue, really dates back to the 1920s as it officially starts. So we'll work through that and just talk about kind of the, the give and take back and forth, take it up to about the 1970s, and then we'll kind of end it there because simply don't have time to go further. But in questions, if you want to ask questions about 80s, 90s, and beyond, I'll happily accommodate those questions, okay? So let's start with some background here. And we'll start kind of with really the Am Am Amtorg Trading Company which is a, a unique organization that as the Soviet Union comes out of its civil war and is trying to reindustrialize and rebuild itself as a normal, somewhat normalized nation with industry and manufacturing, they set up this Amtorn Trading Company, which is designed to be essentially a clearinghouse in the United States that will work with industry and uh, folks like Henry Ford to bring process building engineers over to the Soviet Union to help build their industrial sector because they've just gone through a major civil war. They're trying to get things going for a brand new economy. And the Amthor Corporation is a way to kind of get Soviet uh, representatives in the United States liaising and talking to U.S. industry and business and engineers and scientists and figuring out how to kind of take some of that stuff back. The operative word, take. It's supposed to be an above board business organization. That's really loud. Um, the reality is it's a, it's a front for spying, 
for industrial spying. Uh, yes, there are meetings, but the reality is the Soviets are stealing copious amounts of industrial data on how to build um, production lines. Aircraft engines is a big idea, internal combustion engines, tractors. That type of agricultural military um, complex becomes their main focal point. And I would argue that the way that U.S and the Soviet Union kind of practice and behave in the Cold War can be dated to kind of this period because what happens is the FBI starts to find out that it's not just about amicable business relationships, it really is about them stealing as much as they can and going back to the United or Soviet Union and replicating it, which is a problem, right? We still have this problem to this day with China and some other elements, okay? So the Amtor Trading Company really becomes the trading, really the standard by which the, the Soviet Union will use front organizations as a means to enter the United States on official business, since we're an open society, and then use that front as a means to essentially insert agents, espionage agents, spies, and gather as much information as, as they can to benefit themselves, and as we'll see, or to essentially maybe build plans against the United States. So the Amtor Trading Company goes away in, the 19, in 1933, once the Soviet Union starts building its own uh, first five-year plans and, and economic uh, industrial facilities. But the reality is the FBI is onto it by 1925 and realizes that it, it is really a front organization for industrial and espionage, okay? The second part of this is the Manhattan Project, which is supposedly the most secure project the United States ever embarked on, right? This is the project to build the atomic bomb. And, I think there's a video of me doing a presentation on the Manhattan Project a few years ago if you, at this very institution, if you'd like to kind of look at that. And what's unique is if you look at the lower um, pictures down, the six principles in the Russian uh, atomic spy ring. So Leslie Groves and, and his uh, huge conglomerate of folks that put together and build the various elements of the atomic bomb in the project are obsessed with security. The problem is there are spies within the Manhattan Project. So this is the second main part that kind of starts this espionage thing growing, that the Soviet Union knows that it's behind in, in industry, knows it's behind in science and technology, and then inserts agents within either Amtorg or the Manhattan Project as a way to extract important data uh, or information or intelligence from the United States. Um, what's unique about the atomic spy ring is that... Um, Theodore Hall, Klaus Fuchs, David Greenglass, and the Rosenbergs are probably the most famous. The other folks that aren't known as well, Green, uh, Fuchs, uh, Ted Hall, and Greenglass, actually provide significant economic, no, I'm sorry, scientific and engineering data to the Soviet Union, which allows them to get the bomb about five years earlier than we expected them to get the bomb. So they actually get very good science and technology back, but it saves the Soviet Union lots of time, effort, and money when they start developing their own weapon. And again, what happens is, as the, world, as the World War kicks off, this is kind of unique. So we know there are Soviet spies in the country with Amtorg. The Manhattan Project is supposed to be this you know, tightly guarded secret that no one, no one knows about, even Harry S. Truman, right, the vice president in 45. Um, but yet it's full of some spies. And what's unique is that during the ramp up to kind of in 41, 42, uh, and this leads to Venona, is that the FBI is aware and concerned about illegal Nazi radio stations or propaganda being broadcast around the United States. So they essentially get, get, get kind of roving cars with transceivers on them that can kind of triangulate on an illegal receiver and then go in and bust it. But what they find out around New York, San Francisco, and Chicago is that there are Soviet embassies that are broadcasting all kinds of Ill illegal Soviet diplomatic traffic, and the majority of the traffic relates to either industry or the Manhattan Project, which is, and this is the Venona, which becomes Venona. So trying to find Nazis and root them out, the reality is we don't find many Nazi transceivers, but we find communist transceivers doing things that they're not supposed to be doing and sending copious amounts of information back to the Soviet Union as a means to uh, either get good intelligence on the economic program or just to find out what's going on in the United States. And, and what's unique is during the, during the uh, Second World War, the Soviet Union's our ally, right? So you can't be too harsh on your ally because you're fighting the Nazis. But the reality is the Soviet Union is using spying and espionage as a means to extract as much information as they can. And I, I would argue it's relatively easy in the United States because we're an open society. Whereas in the Soviet Union, we have a really hard time inserting agents into the Soviet Union simply because they have a very good counter-espionage system and it's a closed society, so everyone's suspect. 
right? So if you say, uh, you know, one word and you kind of look suspicious, you know, the NKVD or the KG will, you know, wing you off to Lubyanka prison, do a little torture and get some good information out of you, right? And all of a sudden that network dries up. Whereas in the United States, it becomes a little easier based upon the fact that it's an open and free society. And there are allies, right? So Venona becomes an important element in this because it becomes a means to kind of confirm that there are Soviet espionage rings in the, in the United States, but yet we don't want to let them know that we, we know they're broadcasting things illegally and spying on us, which is kind of cool, right? But that's how Venona is going to be used in testimony against the spies, to specifically the Rosenbergs, to sentence them to death. And there's a big discussion about whether that was uh, legitimate or, or not. So let's move to the 1940s, post-45. So all that stuff's happening with Amtorg in the 20s and 30s, Manhattan Project in the 40s. Venona's going to maintain as an active program through FBI counterintelligence, because remember, we don't have the CIA yet, um, up until the mid-1950s. And what's unique is that they're going to release elements of Venona transcripts and documents in the late 40s to help convict the spies. But the problem is it also has this kind of reverse effect that it makes Americans a bit paranoid that if the Manhattan Project is this most secure, awesome secret, but yet it was infiltrated by Soviet spies, what happens in the U.S. government? So you may have heard of the Red Scare, the second Red Scare. Venona in many ways helps to kind of solidify that and perpetuate it simply because it makes everybody deeply suspicious on the American side that there's spies everywhere. And we'll talk about, you know, McCarthy and those characters who help feed off that. Because the reality is, yes, there are spies. The problem is how many are there, and we can discuss that because no one really knows the true numbers, but the reality is there are spies, okay? So in the 1940s, once the war's over and they're no longer our um, allies, right, we are now in this thing called a new Cold War. And the first major concern, I would argue, as far as intelligence, like active intelligence operations, we're going to move from the Soviet doing their things to the U.S., becoming a uh, much more activist in the international community is concerns over France and Italy. So as we secure Europe and as we figure out what post-war Europe's gonna look like, there are two major concerns about France and Italy. After all, there's a division in Europe, right? The famous Iron Curtain speech that Churchill talks about. But there are concerns because there are active domestic communist parties both in France and Italy. And if you allow open and free elections in 46, 47, 48, there's a significant concern that those governments in France and Italy may turn somewhat leftist, and if they're leftist, they may be communist, and we can't have that in our kind of sphere of influence. So what's a nation to do about that, right? Because you, you can't go in with the military or anything, but there's this thing called the National Security Act of 1947. Maybe you've heard of it, right? Anybody hear it? Yeah, a guy in the back has, right? I think Tom Huber may have heard of it too, right? Um, the National Security Act of 1947 isn't just about reorganizing what becomes Department of Defense and setting up um, the Secretary of Defense and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It also founds the United States Air Force, right, as an independent and separal, separate branch of the military services. It also sets up the CIA, as well as the National Security Council, which works with both of those organizations pretty significantly. And what's unique is that the first kind of National Security Council memorandum, NSC 1-1, comes out, and it's about Italy. And the reality is we have to stay involved in Europe and use any means necessary to ensure that those elections don't turn out communist. Now, if you've been paying attention the last few years, uh, there's been a whole lot of discussions about um, Russia mucking around in U.S. elections. Uh, in the 40s, the U.S. is mucking around in it Italian elections and French elections to ensure that the right side wins, the right side being the Democrats, not the communists or the leftists. And again, this starts the process of active espionage, I would argue, for the United States. Previously, Venona was just collecting signals, intelligence, and data, and information, and disseminating it. But by the time we're in the Cold War, I would argue the new evolution that starts is that we are now being actively involved in doing things, operations, both covertly um, and overtly, by the way. Like, we were paying copious amounts of money to Democrats in France and Italy to ensure that Labor unions come out on the more democratic side, not the socialist side. That's above board, but we're also doing things like helping kidnap leftists and subverting their propaganda and attempts to kind of control the elections. So it's a more activist role, which the CIA 
it starts its kind of is birthed by this first mission that it's it's active, it's dynamic, it's not just about collecting, it's also about practicing and doing intelligence. Okay. The second part of this is, and I would argue this is why this, this also perpetuates the activist mode of the United States and the CIA, is, is the fact that because the Soviet Union is a closed society, we have significant need for information on what their atomic capabilities are and what their military capabilities are. So the United States Air Force, some of its first missions beyond just building war plans for atomic attack are really, they call them ferreting missions. Uh, and what they're doing is they're flying around the periphery of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw, what becomes the Warsaw Pact Central and Eastern Europe, and they're trying to figure out what radars are there, what gun emplacements are there, what the anti-aircraft defense systems look like, can they take pictures, being in international airspace of Soviet you know, industry, out around about Vladivostok, what our port facilities look like, because one of the problems the, the Department of De Defense finds out is that as we go to build war plans against the Soviet Union, we lack significant intelligence on the Soviet Union, even so far as target sets. Like, what does downtown Moscow look like? Well, we're not really sure because we haven't flown over it in about 10 years. So it's kind of hard to build target sets and war plans if you really don't know what they have. So, again, the espionage is going to creep not just from the CIA, but also the intelligence community in, in the military is going to expand to ensure that there's an activist role to, to make sure that you have the information you need because as the Cold War heats up, you want to ensure that that balance in the, in the military and nuclear side is kind of somewhat uh, sustained. You don't want the Soviet Union getting ahead. You don't want the Soviet Union getting behind. And 1949 is probably a, the most critical year in the fact that we think the Soviet Union is going to get the atomic bomb around 1955. Just based upon intelligence we have, and they do kind of simple math on, okay, they took the United States X number of years. We're so much better than them. They don't have, you know, what we have, industry. They don't have the resource to... Uh, to Material, so they extrapolate out in, in the Finn Letter Committee and they put pinpoint 1955, but the reality is it's a guess. So when the Soviets detonate in 49, it's a complete shock to everybody, which further drives this need that we need more intelligence. And the way we find out the Soviets detonated bomb is we have a weather aircraft flying around and they pick up some particles in one of their filters and they figure out, oh, wait, wait, these aren't normal particles. These are uranium, plutonium, things that come from an atomic bomb. So it's again, kind of an accident that we find out, oh, they have the atomic bomb. And they, it further drives that need out of intelligence because you don't know that they had it, and now they do, and you don't know how many, you don't know how, what the production cycle is. So it, again, it's going to drive this demand for more and more intelligence, which is one of the themes of the espionage, is that you, in the context of the Cold War, you can never allow your enemy to get too far ahead of you, and you always want more and more information, right? So you can kind of understand what they're thinking about, trying to understand what they're planning to do. So this drives, I would argue, the whole kind of intelligence community through the duration of the Cold War. Now, I mentioned Venona earlier, and Venona is still active and uh, working through the 1940s. The significance of those, as I mentioned earlier, is that it has a profound impact on the United States domestically in the fact that it helps drive the Red Scare to almost kind of hysterical levels. That, you know, there's a there's a communist over every bed. There's, you know, anybody that wears a red shirt or talks about leftist issues is a communist, which is unique. But the reality is, from the kind of intelligence U.S. counter espionage side, it actually has a profound impact because what it did is it actually smashed the vast majority of the Soviet intelligence networks in the United States. So it allows us to round up a whole bunch of people and arrest them and or deport them because the Soviet Union has a unique way of inserting people in the United States. Uh, specifically under the wartime conditions. I either come over as, you know, uh, I'm a representative of the Soviet government, but I have two jobs. I have my normal day job, and then I, I walk around D.C. and I spy and send information back. Or they come in as, um, I'm a reporter, here are my credentials, but the reality is I work for the KGB or the NKVD. Um, so Venona, it, it actually allows the United States and the FBI to really break the Soviet network that's in the States during the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And what's unique is by the 1950s, the Soviets are going to try, try to rebuild that network, and they're pretty successful. In fact, Sarah, who isn't here right now, asked me if I was going to talk about the Americans, which was that awesome FX show a few years ago, about Soviet agents living in D.C., right, posing as Americans. All true, by the way. At, at least true as they were trying to build this internal network. Now, great liberties in the TV show, but the premise that the Soviets are cultivating Soviet citizens, Soviet spies, to live as Americans and to live, gather, intelli gather intelligence, and then perpetuate 
with children who will you know, easily be able to slip into the U.S. government and work, all true. And we'll talk about Directorate S and the KGB because it's, again, one, of the, one more of those iterations. All right? So by, I would argue by the 19, end of the 1940s, there's a robust active network going on on the U.S. side. And the U.S. demand is really for more and more intelligence on the atomic side and the military side. On the Soviet side, they're just trying to kind of figure everything out coming out of the Second World War and rebuild the network that was crushed by Venona. All right, 1950s, um, which is kind of the heyday of, of, of espionage, right? When you think of the 50s, it's, you know, all the good stuff. Um, we'll talk about the main adversary and director at S. Then we'll talk about William Fisher, the Berlin Tunnel. And this is where it becomes kind of a little more exciting. You can kind of see the back and forth, and you get more James Bondy type of stuff going on here, right? So let's talk about the main adversary and director at S. Is the NKVD is the main kind of spy agency for the Soviet Union. And, and what's unique is... Kind of like the United States, the Soviet Union has the NKVD, which is the official state intelligence organization, but they also have the GRU, which is the military side of it. And the two don't work together. Unlike the U.S., where the FBI and the CIA will work pretty closely with um, military intelligence, these two are completely apart. In fact, they don't work together until 1983 for the first time. And if you want to ask me about that in the, in the questions, you can, because it's, it's a unique situation that brings them together. Uh, prior to that, they are in many ways competitive with one another, and they are very stovepiped as far as their information. They don't share information with one another. It is direct to their own lines of communication and for different purposes. GRU is all about military intelligence. They don't cross into political diplomatic stuff. KGB does internal, external, and all that diplomatic and industrial stuff as well. Okay. So the main adversary in Director S is important because the KGB, which is going to be the predecessor to the NKVD, is going to first and foremost identify the United States as the main enemy that this is where we're going to direct the majority of our intelligence sources and not just the United States, but also maybe some of their close allies, the French, the Germans, and the U.S. But the reality is they focus on the United States as the hub of all power. So if we think about the Cold War as, as bipolar, which I have problems with, from the Soviet perspective, they see the United States really as that hub of the allied effort. So therefore, that's where we're going to direct all your main intelligence assets. And, and the reality is it's not a bad move because... We do have a strong military, right? We are a world superpower. We have atomic weapons, and they are trying to play catch-up based upon the significant uh, impact that the Second World War have, had on them. Now, Director at S, which is the, uh, the picture up in the corner of those gentlemen with all the accoutrement on their, on their uh, blazers, that's the first uh, administrators of Director at S. And Director at S is... Again, I'll, I'll drift into the Americans because it, it's, it's easy, right? How many of you have seen the Americans? Anybody? Okay, only a few. You should go home tonight and watch it. It's awesome, right? Um, Director S is part of the KGB, but it, it's, it's really designed to develop illegal networks of spies living in the United States. So it's about taking folks like, we'll talk William Fisher here in a few seconds, and giving them a false identity inserting them in the United States and allowing them to kind of just live their life as a normal American citizen or immigrant and then also provide significant data intelligence back to the United States. So Director S is the illegal directorate of the KGB, and that maintains itself up through 1991, 1992. And we can talk about um, a few more other characters. Like I'll talk about Oleg Kalugin um, in the 70s, who's another famous director at S. But let's go into William Fisher, who's probably the best example of Director S and who he is. Um, William Fisher's his real name, right? Born in Russia in 1903 to um, parents who are very sympathetic to the radicalization against the Tsar. They are diehard supporters of the, of the Bolsheviks. Um, they're going to end up moving to um, England in the 1920s. Uh, no one really knows why, especially since the Bolsheviks are winning. I would assume it had something to do with the fact that they may have been on the wrong side of the Bolsheviks. They may have been more Menshevik in their outlook than Bolshevik. But nevertheless, young uh, William is, is being cultivated, and he goes through several spa schools with the NKVD in the 20s. They actually moved back to the, uh, to the Soviet Union in the 1930s after the purges, which is significant, which again makes me think they were on the Menshevik side, not the Bolshevik side. Um, so they come back after... Um, the purges happened in 38, 39, so they come back in 40. And William is 
teaching classes at what becomes the NKVD School on Intelligence, and he's teaching things about radios and transmission and all that stuff. So he's kind of a technical expert who knows how to use radios to send signals to faraway places. Um, he continues that role throughout the war, training intelligence, in, in, training, training intelligence experts in really radio hardware. Um, after the war, they don't know what to do with them. And what's unique is that in the 50s, as they're trying to build this new director at S, um, he becomes a perfect candidate. In fact, they say, hey, why don't we send you to the United States via Canada, by the way, on a Latin American passport, right? And his, his cover is Emil Goldfarb, right? Which doesn't sound very Latin, but, you know, hey, that's, that's the passport they give him. And he ends up on the West Coast, uh, and, he, and he lives between, he, he actually moves between Long Beach and San Francisco, and the reality is he's there to help, help cultivate relationships in the ports to figure out what the United States is shipping towards um, Korea and ultimately as it happened, China in the late 40s. So he's there from about 47 to about 52. Uh, and his, his whole process or whole, whole purpose there is to generate really ship manifests and information on what we're sending to Korea as we fight the war in Korea. And what's unique is that he, he develops... He lives under that, 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 uh, that cover and develops a vast network of uh, operatives that have Latin American connections. So he's not just looking at U.S. stuff. He's also looking at what we're sending, not just to Korea and China, but also what we're doing down south in Latin America and South America. Um, that once, the, the, uh, w once the Korean War is over, um, he gets a new identity, goes back to Canada, gets the, the name Rudolph Abel because the Emil one, has, they think, may have been compromised and he's been moving from the West Coast to the East Coast, so they figure, hey, let's give him a new name, new identity, right? Uh, Rudolph Abel is going to end up a, a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1954, which is unique, right? And the way the Soviets do this, they have lots of passports that they use, mainly from dead folks that died during the war. And what they do is just kind of recycle them, they clean them, and then they give them to you, and then you, you know, Rudolph Abel shows up via Canada again, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, an old German, you know, came to the United States, want to prosper and do well, right? You know, long live the USA. Ends up being naturalized, but he's also running intelligence networks within New York, Virginia, and cultivating folks within the U.S. government. So DOD, right, Department of Economics, and he's sending intelligence back to the Soviet Union via radio signals through what is supposed to be diplomatic channels. Venona is what catches Rudolf Abel. So again, Venona becomes significantly important because it is, um, it's probably the best, best means to kind of seize on to those signals and then you just kind of track them to his apartment and he goes. Now what's unique is that he's arrested in 1957. Uh, about 11 months prior to his arrest, he's, he's, he's given directions from his KGB handlers that he should leave New York, go back to Canada, come back to the Soviet Union because they think his position has been compromised. He doesn't listen. He stays in New York and, and becomes an art dealer and some other things, and the reality is ends up getting arrested, and then he's going to spend a few years in prison, and then he's going to be traded for uh, Gary Powers in 1963. So it's a great example that you have a folk, folks like this who, again, grew up in the Soviet system, were able to kind of clean their, their background and identity, and end up in the United States under various identities on the West Coast and East Coast, and their sole purpose is to live as Americans, and provide data and information and intelligence to the Soviet Union. And he is a full-blown KGB agent, but he's part of Director S, which what happens, they will never acknowledge it or you know, recognize that he is a spy until he's back in the Soviet Union, and then we'll give him all kinds of hero awards and things like that. And you'll see that with like Kim Philby and a bunch of others that work for the British as well. So Director S is, is pretty important in this, in this game, and Rudolf Abel is probably the best early example of them trying to rebuild this network. Because the idea is if you get Abel into the United States and comfortable and situated, and he can get married to, you know, an American girl, right, and they have children. There's no question about those kids being Americans, right? They're good red-blooded Americans. They get jobs in DOD or they work for Lockheed Martin, and all of a sudden now you can cultivate even deeper intelligence because there's no need to kind of have cover stories because they're U.S. citizens. Pretty cool, right? Or not. On the U.S. side, right, and again, the, the way the nations approach espionage, I would argue, is somewhat different, that the Soviet Union is really about using human intelligence and, and developing spies and spy networks because they believe that's the best 
means to kind of access the information they want, which is like production numbers and research and science and all that fun stuff. The U.S. is much more kind of scientifically inclined. We want information and data. All right. Is there a way to bring this back on? Anybody? We can talk about it. If it doesn't go, I can go without slides. But the Berlin Tunnel is, is a unique element in, in fact that it starts really as a, as a uh, UK operation in, in Austria, in Vienna, which is really the hubbub of all power, uh, or really all spying in. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> it's the hub of all power in, or the hubbub of all spying in the early Cold War, because Austria is neutral, so there are spies from everywhere there. And the British um, intelligence service starts a process called Operation Silver, where they're trying to tap into Soviet uh, phone lines and just listen to conversations. And the U.S. thinks this is pretty cool. And then as the United States works with the British, they think it may be a vi valuable operation. And as we get up into Berlin and the CIA is standing up and figuring out that there are um, opportunities for the United States to do this, we come up with this thing called Operation Gold. This is what I like about setting a spy stuff, right? So if the, if the British one was silver, we have to be better as far as Operation Gold, right? Because it's quantitatively better. Then it's going to morph, morph into Operation Regal because, you know, it's even higher than gold, right? Um, but what's unique is that right on that east-west German border, right, the east, east Berlin, west Berlin, um, the, the CIA finds out that right across the line, right by a cemetery, is a central uh, communications network for the Warsaw Pact. And it is literally like five kilometers from, uh, maybe not even five kilometers, probably 500 feet from the border. Uh, and they realize that if they tunnel underneath it, right, so they start on their side, there's a big warehouse on the, on the west side. If you build a basement to that and tunnel down and then go across, you could probably access those communication nodes and tap into the phone lines. And if you set up a, an awesome kind of communications listening center, you can record conversations and listen and get good data on what the Warsaw Pact is doing and planning. And again, this, this is kind of Wile E. Coyote-esque, right? And, and, and the process is kind of comical. So they have to procure the right size building. Then they have to ensure that, you know, no one's watching them pull copious amounts of dirt out of the building because they're digging down about 30, 40 feet, and then they're going to have to go 500 to 1,000 yards vertically across the east-west border, which is interesting, right? And the way they do it is they're going to have prefabbed metal and concrete elements that you just kind of push forward. Think of it like a big PVC tube, and you just kind of put a piece in, dig more out, bring out the debris, put another piece in, and keep moving forward. Now, the, the problem is that they're also below the water line, so they have to build pumps into this thing because it keeps flooding and all kinds of fun stuff. But the reality is, no, no problem. Um, is that the whole intent is it takes about a year to build, which is unique in the fact that they do this without getting caught because you have people coming and going and... Um, it is a fair amount of dirt, not to mention the prefab elements that you put into it. Um, when they build it on the east side, they have a trap door that can't be opened, or so they think it can't be opened. And that's just in case you know, anything ever happens and they can kind of blow it up and be good to go. Uh, it operates for about 11 months and 11 days, and they're getting all kinds of awesome, awesome information because, as I said, they found out in, uh, that the vast majority of all the Warsaw Pact communication came through that communications hub. And they're getting great information on troop movements, troop deployments, command and control issues, and all that fun stuff. But one of the problems is that you have this tunnel under the ground, right, that has to have some heat and pumps going, right? And when it snows in Germany, right, you may have a problem because the ground that the tunnel occupies is going to be warmer than the ground around it. So one of the, one of the first kind of indicators on the, on the Soviet side, on the East Berlin side, is when it snows in this 11-month period during the wintertime, they recognize that there's one strip of land that seems to melt quicker than everything else, right? <laughs> and it's not like, you know, all of a sudden it snows and there's one strip, but the reality is they'll, it'll snow and then that strip will kind of melt quicker than everything. And if it happens two or three times, you become somewhat suspicious. 
And literally uh, 11 months, on the 11th day of the 11th month, uh, they're digging around in the dirt to figure out what's going on, and they hit something steel. And they find out, oh, there's something here. And that door that was supposed to be able to blow from the inside actually just opened right up. Nobody, it wasn't locked. You know, some contractor probably didn't, didn't lock it, right? Um, and they, they rush in and they find out there's all this communications equipment and listening devices and how to tap phones. And if the slides were up, there's a picture of Soviet officers in the tunnel just inspecting anything. And the CIA was a bit embarrassed by this, as was the Army, because the Army was helping with, with this process. And what, what they do is they're like, okay, do we admit this or do we just keep quiet? And they think the Soviets are going to be very, very embarrassed that we were listening in on their, their, their phone conversations. And they're not going to even talk about it because it shows that they may have uh, a weakness. The reality is the Soviets flip it around to demonstrate, see, the U.S. is up to dirty tricks and nasty business. So it's highly publicized. They bring camera crews out and all kinds of stuff and all of a sudden kind of ambush everybody and say, hey, see, this, see what the West is doing? We're just minding our own business, making telephone calls. And all of a sudden, these dastardly you know, folks in the West are you know, digging tunnels and spying on us. And it's just not good, good for business. Um, which is unique, okay? Um, the next element of this, which goes along with the um, tunnel, is the U-2. So the tunnel is good for collecting signals intelligence, but if you really want to get over the Soviet Union, which has always been a problem, we've been trying to fly around the periphery, but the problem is you can't get deep into the Soviet Union, you can't get deep into the industrial centers. So the, the issue is how can you fly over, get good intelligence, but yet if you do that, it's technically an act of war, right? It's illegal, but you need it because it helps to uh, maintain the, that strategic nuclear balance. So the U-2 becomes um, the means to collect that data, photographic intelligence. So it's designed in secret, right? It's designed by a joint CIA uh, Air Force team. Kelly Johnson's a designer. It really is a rocket power or a jet powered glider that flies about 70,000 feet. And what's interesting, and this goes back to Am Torg and Venona, is that when they're producing the aircraft, uh, they recognize that there may be spies in the system. So they develop two sets of manuals. They develop a, the real manual that says, you know, that has all the procedures and everything. And they develop a second set that lim limits the ceiling at like 50,000 feet and gives false information on everything else, which is kind of interesting. So they're aware that it may be compromised, so you make sure that the bad set gets out and the good set is significantly uh, controlled and only handled by those that have a need to know. But the, the U-2 is, is in many ways an awesome piece of intelligence gathering because it can fly at 70,000 feet. It has a phenomenal camera system. The camera system on the U-2 will become the base of camera systems for uh, satellites that we see uh, just a few years later. Uh, which is amazing, and the problem with the U-2, though, is that you are technically flying over an enemy country taking pictures, um, and the Eisenhower administration, which uses the U-2, and Eisenhower approves, flight, approves flights starting in 55, 56. There's intelligence from the CIA that the Soviets are developing an anti-aircraft system and or MiG-21s that can kind of zoom up and then shoot with uh, missiles to kind of do a shotgun effect on the U-2, but Eisenhower believes that the need for strategic intelligence is necessary, so he's willing to risk this, and he does this up through 1960, right? May of 1960 is the last U-2 flight that he approves. Uh, Gary Powers, who was then shot down, and then the Soviet Union, you know, has a, a trophy. Uh, and again, the, the game, right? It really is, in many ways, a game that when the Eisenhower administration has to figure out they lost to U-2. Um, the first cover story is, well, we've had a weather aircraft, you know, a NASA weather aircraft fly off course, and we lost it, right? And the Soviet Union sends a diplomatic response, essentially saying, really? Is that your, is that your right answer? Is that, your true, is that the true story? Yep, absolutely. It was an Air Force weather aircraft, veered off site. And then about a day and a half later, they issued this very tersely worded dip, uh, diplomatic communique saying the Soviet Union is, you know, filing a formal protest in the UN of the U.S. flying spy flights over the Soviet Union. The U.S. response is, we, we would never do that. The Soviet response is, well, this guy says different. And they, they trot out Gary Powers and pieces of the U-2 and um, his 
His survival kit, which has cyanide tablets in it and stuff like that. So you have that game <laughs> going as well, which, again, there's some, there's some comedy there because Powers was actually flying for the CIA, and there's indicators that the ejection procedure had one last step, which was a self-destruct mechanism, which most of the pilots have um, admitted that if you hit that, you're probably not going to eject. It'll just blow the aircraft up and you go with it, which is a way to save face, right? Powers didn't do that last uh, self-destruct mechanism, just kind of punched out of the aircraft and floated down safely to the Soviet Union and became one of the world's famous spies, right? And then he gets traded in 63 for... Rudolph Abel. So this whole system kind of works together. Uh, can I pull it up or no? Are we, are we still working? Okay, no worries. We can go without, right? Who needs slides, right? It's just good pictures. Um, so the, the U-2 becomes, again, that, that reinforcing mechanism of the United States loves technical capabilities, right? And whether it's the Berlin Tunnel or the U-2, we seem to have this propensity for kind of technical means to gather intelligence, whereas the Soviets are really more about getting folks into the United States and um, extracting data that way. All right, we're almost there. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. All right. Just in time. Let's talk paramilitary operations, because... As I talked about technical means and the coming out of the 1950s and into kind of the 60s, the CIA is moving beyond those mucking around in elections and now with, with the success they think they had in Iran and then Guatemala about developing paramilitary operations to topple governments, right? And the Mossadegh situation in Iran is the first success, one that they have. Guatemala is the second one. And by that time, the CIA is pretty sure that their new role in the world is paramilitary operations to take down governments and do dirty tricks, right? Essentially bring down anything that's Soviet or communist. And there just happens to be a phenomenal case study 90 miles off our coast called Cuba with Fidel Castro rising to power. So Alan Dulles is going to start building a, a plan to uh, build an invasion force uh, to land in Cuba and foment a, a counter-revolution against Castro and take, ca uh, take Cuba back and install a non-communist regime. Now, you may know this as the Bay of Pigs, which it is. Um, but the reality is it's built under the Eisenhower administration as they had success with operations in Iran and Guatemala. The problem is it moved those under the Kennedy administration He's going to be, be the president who okays the Bay of Pigs or says yes to it. But the problem is the Bay of Pigs operation, when the CIA had it, it was a pretty tightly focused operation. It was a bunch of Cuban exiles um, that were being trained to uh, essentially land on five to six beaches in Cuba and infiltrate into the communities and then build a revolution from within. However... The military got wind of this and wasn't really happy because it seemed too slow and it may take too long, and they put a Marine lieutenant colonel in charge. And if Marines know how to do one thing, it's how to build an amphibious assault force. So the operation that the CIA built, all of a sudden when, the, when DOD gets involved with a Marine in charge, it becomes an amphibious assault force, which means U.S. ships, fire support, aircraft. Uh, so the operation goes from this small, controlled, tight-knit kind of slow, incremental build from within to, no, we're going to land on Iwo Jima and take it back. Uh, the problem is, I think you know how the Bay of Pigs goes. It is, it's kind of hard to mask ships coming ashore and aircraft coming ashore. In fact, the Castro regime is very good at handling it and then shoots a bunch of aircraft down. The Kennedy administration does not allow U.S. aircraft to provide airstrikes or naval gunfire support, and it fails miserably. And it's another stain on... Um, the CIA's kind of paramilitary um, uh, operations, but yet they don't give it up. They won't give it up until the 70s, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Now, on the KGB side, what are they doing this whole time? They're thinking the world is starting to kind of shift their way because the 60s is kind of that, that last wave of anti-colonialism, and you have folks like Ole Kalugin here who is posing as a, um, a TASS reporter, but his true job is to travel to Florida once or twice a year and cultivate uh, relationships with Cuban exiles and to ensure that the United States isn't planning another Bay of Pigs. 
And if you read Ole Kalugin's um, biography, uh, and his autobiography as well, is that he is a true believer, and he has these awesome stories about he and some of his colleagues are hanging out in Cuba, again, posing as Latin Americans, which I can't get over this, right? Time and time again, you have these Russians who tend to have deep accents posing as Latin Americans, which it seems odd to me, right? And they're in, they're in this hotel room in, in Miami talking to do a bunch of revolutionaries, and one of the revolutionaries makes, a, or counter-revolutionaries makes a point that, wait a minute, you kind of have an odd accent. Where are you from? And he's like, oh, I'm from, you know, I'm Brazil. No, 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 that's not Portuguese. So he and, he and his buddy kind of hightail it out of there before they get found out. So again, this emphasis on the Soviet side is as we're striving to do this kind of high-tech thing with U-2s and Berlin tunnels and these awesome paramilitary operations, the Soviets rely on kind of the tried and true method of old school intelligence, right? Human operations. You get people in, you know, I'm just a college professor, but you know, by night I'm fomenting revolution from within, all right? And that's going to be a consistent theme, as I said, throughout. Now also in the 1960s, because of the U-2, uh, both sides are going to, again, the quest for intelligence, right? We have a brand new technology coming along, and that's space. And we can see two elements of space right here, right? The Soviet, Soviet Union space, right? This is based on, upon their uh, Vostok spaceship, right? You just take the Yuri Gagarin out and the stuff to maintain an astronaut or cosmonaut, and you put in cameras. And their approach to satellite development is pretty simple, right? You have a workable spacecraft, you don't need a human in it or a dog. You just plug that stuff with signals intelligence equipment, photographs, you know, missile detection stuff, which is pretty cool on their end. So they do look like this, and you can kind of see the camera and then other lenses and then things where it's going to jettison back. Um, on the U.S. side, the Corona Project is going to be our first uh, intelligence uh, satellite. And you can see here is a map of the coverage of the first Corona mission. And what's unique is that with the satellite, you don't have to worry about it getting shot down. You don't have to worry about the Soviets capturing the pilot. You also get, in one mission, more coverage than all the U-2 flights combined without the risk. So this becomes a new wave of, ah, we can use outer space now to spy and get the intelligence that we need. And really, the Kennedy administration is where it's going to start under Eisenhower, but it's going to really take off, no pun intended, under under Kennedy, where space is going to become the next major means for really the intelligence game and espionage, where both sides are going to use the first generation satellites and then develop communication networks that can spy, signals intelligence, thermo radiation things for detecting missile plumes, taking pictures, and the pictures go from kind of being fuzzy gray to, you know, being able to pick out there's four cars in the parking lot and they are, uh, you know, a Dodge, a Ford, and, you know, a Corvette, which is pretty amazing. So, again, I think as you get closer to the end of the 60s and, and towards the 70s, there's a transition taking place where while the Soviets do rely on this, they are, they are finding out that you can get better and more intelligence by just flying satellites over. Now, it's a different type of intelligence, right? You may not be able to figure out what I'm thinking, but you can figure out how many missiles we're producing, how many tanks we're producing, so on and so forth. So it gives you more intelligence on the strategic military side than it does kind of the diplomatic human side. But yet the human side is still important, but yet it's kind of risky. All right, let's talk about the operational ethos and the change going on in the 70s, and then we'll leave some time for some questions. Um, Let's start with, with this, the, we'll start with the CIA and then talk about the KGB afterward. Um, coming out of Vietnam, the CIA has some problems. Remember that paramilitary thing we talked about and how they became obsessed with it? Um, Project Phoenix and a few other actions in Vietnam and the church committee after Vietnam really exposes the hijinks that the CIA was doing throughout the 50s and 60s. Uh, including spying on American citizens, including kind of conducting operations in America. So Congress is kind of clamping down on it. And as the Carter administration comes to power, Jimmy Carter has a real problem with the CIA and it's what he perceives as abuse of power. And he's about to kind of cut the whole paramilitary program, but hold right there and I'll come back to that. Okay, so this is my cliffhanger for you, right? We'll come back to it. Um, his director of the CIA is Admiral Stansfield Turner. And Turner is a stand-up Navy guy, right? Has, has had a phenomenal naval career, and he's placed here because Carter thinks he can trust him to kind of transform the CIA. And the transformation that Carter wants is a move from paramilitary 
operations to techn gathering national technical means is what they call it. So really it's signals intelligence and I don't want to use spies, I don't want to risk any confrontation, I just want to get as much passive information as I can. So Turner comes to the CIA with the new ethos of, hey, this human stuff we've been doing, we're not doing it anymore. This is all about using advanced technology, spacecraft, uh, national technical means to gather as much intelligence as we can without risking confrontation with the Soviet Union. And there's significant tension in the CIA over this because they've had 20, 30 years of developing paramilitary operations, some human capability, and some other means, and all of a sudden you have an admiral come in, right, and say, no, 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 we're not doing that anymore. You need to understand things are changing. And there's some real fighting going on. Now, what's unique is that Carter, the National Security Advisor, this is a big new Brzezinski, sees kind of a middle path between these two. And the middle path is, okay, you can't get rid of all the paramilitary stuff because the Soviet Union is still around, the KGB is still around. But there may be some opportunities, specifically in Poland and in Afghanistan. And what Zabrinsky convinces Carter is that there's human rights issues at stake here, right? That the folks in Poland that start what becomes the Solidarity Movement are fighting for the right to unionize. This is a basic American right for Poles, right? For Polish ship workers. Now, the Soviets don't like Solidarity. The Poles don't like Solidarity. Well, the Polish government doesn't like Solidarity. Poles love solidarity, right? And it becomes this awesome, not just a union movement, but also a political network. So Brzezinski convinces Carter, who is really about human rights. In fact, if he's known for one thing, it's about you know, how do we cultivate and maintain and push human rights, which becomes a critical vulnerability of the Soviet Union at this, at this unique time, as a means. And Brzezinski tells him, you know what you can use? You can use paramilitary operations to do that. If you fund elements like we did in the 40s, like in Italy and France, and you support solidarity overtly, like, you know, like Walenza and solidarity is a great movement, but you also funnel m material to them, money, to help them pr print material, to help them build their brand, build their following, and, and Carter kind of likes it. He's a bit suspicious at first of paramilitary, but he likes the idea that what you're doing is you're promoting democracy, and freedom, right? Who doesn't like that? Now, the other piece of that is the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. So in 79, when the Soviets invade, Brzezinski again convinces Carter that, oh, you can use paramilitary CIA operations in Afghanistan and start giving these folks weapons to help fight off the Soviets because they're encroaching upon their rights. And the first set of you know, CIA operations, which are going to work through Pakistan, are really kind of vintage World War II rifles, and the Mujahideen are like, yeah, yeah, these are great, but we want something that can take down kind of Soviet helicopters and tanks, and it's going to evolve under Reagan to stingers and blowpipes and all kinds of fun stuff, okay? So again, what's unique is that it's really it's Brzezinski who kind of saves the paramilitary side of that because he sees Carter's unwillingness to use it, but yet seizes on Carter's obsession with human rights and then can link it to both solidarity and Afghanistan. It's basically about human rights freedom and democracy, so you can use it for the good and not necessarily get the bad that we saw in Iran, Guatemala, and even Cuba. Now, on the Soviet side, this guy. Anybody know who this guy is? Yuri yeah, Yuri Andropov, the longtime head of the KGB. He sees the 70s as a unique period in time in the fact that coming out of the 60s in the U.S. and Vietnam, he sees it, and he terms it this way, that the world is going our way that the Soviet Union and communism seems to be winning, not just in colonial elements in Africa and Latin America, but also in Vietnam and also possibly in Central Europe. So he starts an activist campaign to start pushing more operations in Latin America, Africa, and around the globe, paramilitary style, to help throw out kind of pro-democratic or U.S. left or your U.S. leaning uh, government. So it's almost coming full circle, uh, which is unique. That they start kind of much more focused on human, and then they kind of end up kind of doing more par paramilitary stuff. But he is a die-in-the-wool communist, um, long, like I said, a long-time head of the KGB. He's going to ascend to be the first premier after Brezhnev dies, uh, and he becomes a guy who is always paranoid and never leaves kind of his KGB roots behind. In fact, when he becomes um, general secretary one of his first moves is he's obsessed with the first strike on the Soviet Union in 1983 because he's afraid of Reagan. He thinks Reagan really is a cowboy who's going to start a nuclear war. 
he's the guy who's going to bring the KGB and the GRU together and start monitoring U.S. military bases and the government to see if they're preparing for a first strike. And at first, the, the, the two elements don't want to work together, but then they realize and drop off uh, will make you disappear if you don't say yes. Right? And they start doing things like how many Domino's pizzas are being delivered to the Pentagon? How many cars are in the parking lot after 5 o'clock? And they do this not just in the U.S., but also in NATO. And what's unique is that the KGB, the longtime kind of, you know, people in the trenches doing the work, think he's crazy. But they have to say yes. Yeah. So after about six months of this, he's in kind of ill health, and the program just kind of slowly withers away. It's called Operation Ryan. But he is deeply obsessed about gathering the intelligence they need for a first strike. So I would argue the 70s become kind of a culmination point where the U.S. is starting to kind of see a transition. Yes, we're going to use more and more satellites and, and technical means to gather intelligence, but also we see the way we can use kind of paramilitary operations, not in the traditional sense of coups, but now paramilitary operations, much more in that sense of kind of NSC 1-1, right? How can we influence governments and elections to ensure uh, they are hurting the Soviet Union and they're going to break our way? Uh, whereas the KGB is kind of going in a different direction where they're going to kind of start fostering more and more uh, assistance to kind of paramilitary operations, and they're going to start clamping down more and more on their own people as well. Because what's, what's unique, and we'll, we can go back to Ole Kalugin. Kalugin, a long-time KGB officer, right? Uh, in the late 80s, he's recalled to the United States, and he's involved in essentially a trial about whether he's really uh, dedicated to the tenants of the Soviet Union. And if you read his, his autobiography, he talks about how he served this institution and was committed to the institution, and then when that happens, he loses all faith in the institution. And part of it is, he's like, I, I think I may have been in the West too long, right? The essentially, the, you know, the thing I was standing up for and trying to fight communism and, or fight for and maintain came back and, you know, essentially tried to throw me in jail and maybe execute me. And he's one of the, if, if, you, if you follow what happened in the Soviet Union in the 1990s, he's a leading candidate to kind of multi-party systems and democracy, which is kind of unique in the fact that he spends the vast majority of his career in the United States illegally spying on us. But, and he lives in the States now, which is awesome. Okay? So, I'll leave it there, right? If you want more of the story, 80s, 90s, right, 2000s, it's here. Um, thanks for entertaining me. Um, I hope it was informative, and I'll take some questions now. Sir, I think they want a mic, right? Uh, was there another communications hub for the uh, Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact that was found someplace offshore uh, in the Baltic Sea? And uh, there were some shenanigans with a submarine that they were able to tap into it? Yeah, the, the submarine cables. So they yeah. find out that a lot of that information is going through the Baltic Sea. So you send essentially a, a submarine down. You, you hover over the cable, right? And you put kind of airlock around it. And then you find out which wires are the Soviet or Warsaw Pact ones. And you tap into them and just listen. Yeah. You know, there's all kinds of awesome. Like, uh, I think it's called uh, Blind Man's Bluff is the one about the Navy operations, which happened and they're tapping in. So that, I, again... When writing this, I had to find kind of a way to kind of condense it into something useful. And that, that dynamic with the U.S. seems to be all about these high-tech solutions, right? And uh, awesome solutions. But that information is good, but it doesn't get you the human stuff. And where the Soviets is much better at the human stuff, but not so good at the technical stuff. So it's just kind of this give and take all the time. But yeah, Bi Blind, Blind Man's Bluff is a great book on the Navy and their spy missions because... Right? If you can listen to telephone conversations and find out where they're moving troops around and why, it's pretty awesome, right? You can't get caught off guard. Good question. Uh, you talk about uh, uh, some amazing, uh, amazing uh, spies at work, uh, Rudolf Abel and uh, Kim Philby, et cetera. Uh, but I wondered if you'd run into any genuine uh, double agents who were making their lives better by spying for both sides at once. <laughs> Yes, there's lots of double agents that come. And what's unique is, from the, reading from the Soviet side, is that the, the folks they, that will spy for them, the 20s, 30s, and 40s, are really committed idealistic communists. Like, they think communism is the way. You know, Ted Hall, Klaus Fuchs. 
after the Second World War is over, they don't seem to be as committed ideologically. They're really in it for money. So you'll see kind of, you know, dual agents in, you know, who can I get the best deal from? And it's all about me getting rich or getting famous versus commitment to the cause, which is, you know, you have to be careful with that stuff. So there are many through the 60s and 70s about, yeah, a lot of Brits end up that way, right? That we don't know who really who they are. Well, who do they work for? Like Philby, right? Uh, James Jesus Angleton, who works for the CIA and their counter intel, right? Counter espionage element is obsessed with moles in the system and double agents. So he, he, in many ways, promotes this paranoid ethos in the CIA. That there's, you know, you got to be really careful because there are double agents everywhere. And he's probably not too far off, but it's probably not as bad as he thinks it is, but it's not as, you know, rosy as, you know, there are none. So, yeah. Let's go, let's distribute it, and we'll come back to you. Sean, a uh, little bit outside your time scale, but you had Aldrich Ames, oh, yeah. John Walker, Spy Ring, most, I guess in the 90s, a lot of that happened in the 80s and 90s. Uh, it sort of takes a little different spin than what you talked about because those guys were homegrown type. Yeah. Do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, let's go with, with Aldrich James, right, who's kind of a unique devil agent, right, that he, he's working on building U.S. networks in the Soviet Union in really the late 70s and 80s, and he's pretty successful at it, but he becomes a bit disillusioned. He's going through kind of a bad divorce. Uh, he doesn't believe he's being treated um, the way he should at the agency and thinks he be, should be promoted, so he kind of walks into uh, the KGB embassy, I think, in uh, Mexico City, and says, hey, I have some information for you. Right? And they're like, well, who is this bozo? Right? And they, they cultivate him. And, and the reality is, uh, a Ames is unique in the fact that we were having some success finally building a network in the Soviet Union in the late 70s and 80s. Ames gives it up. And what's unique is that the CIA, as they're trying to extract information, they keep trying to figure out, hey, all of our agents are disappearing. We have no idea where they are. It's because Ames is giving them up. So he has, he, he has a lot of blood on his hands in, in the fact that he gave up critical information on the Soviet Union, on our spy network in the Soviet Union. Those guys, those folks ended up dead because the KGB has zero tolerance for that. Yeah, and John Walker, you know, similar. Uh, and it's unique as you get into the 70s and 80s that the folks... There's almost like an ego involved with it. Like, you know, this is, a, you know, I'll show you I'm really good. I'll go work for the Soviets, but I'm, you know, how much I can get away with them. They all end up getting caught, and then they're, I, they're not really remorseful about it. They're just kind of like, yeah, it happened, right? But it has a profound impact on national security. And it ramps up that tension in the system, too, that every time you have one of those incidents, like both sides just kind of bear down, like, okay, I can't trust you now. So if you overlay this with, like, arms control discussions and things, you can kind of see spikes in tension over espionage incidents and then diplomatic moves to kind of dissipate that because you don't want tension to spill over either military action or, you know, thermonuclear military action. Sir. Uh, in, I think it was the late 50s, uh, there was a leader in uh, Africa by the name of Patrice Lumumba and uh, he uh, ended up uh, decidedly dead uh, because he had evidently leftist or communist leanings. Uh, did the CIA or have anything to do with that? I don't know specifically, but I would, I would bet they were... What's you, the, yeah, but the CIA typically has... Like they may have case offers, but they were very good at... We won't do the dirty work. We'll kind of contract that out because there's always <laughs> a, a colonial nation that's willing to kind of help out. I mean, and you can go with the Zim regime in Vietnam too, right? That there was a CIA plan to kind of assassinate him at the last minute. Like, no, no, no. Why don't you guys do it yourself, right? So it, it's, hard, it's hard writing about this stuff because a, a lot of the operations are still classified simply because you don't want that stuff to leak out. So you have to kind of put pieces together. And like, oh, the Belgians did it, right? But the reality is the CIA is involved and they planted a, you know, hey, this guy should go away. So, yeah. And that's kind of, it, it, that's why I call it a game. I mean, it really is this kind of, you know, unique game that, that we're playing on. Who can get ahead? You know, how can we slant the table to, to benefit us? But you want to do it in a way that isn't, 
dirty or underhanded because we're all about freedom and light, right? Mm -hmm. But yet, it's a dirty game. So you kind of have to try to keep your hands clean and at least above board be like, I didn't do that. The Belgians did that, right? But the reality is you provided everything they needed. While while I've got the microphone, I'll ask one more question and I'll shut up. Um, Klaus Fuchs uh, was convicted, I think, of of spying, Mm -hmm. but he didn't receive much of a sentence. He kind of got off er easy. Uh, what, What happened? He, he kind of repents, right? And, and Klaus Fuchs is, is a unique character in the fact that he, he is one of the, the early ones in the Manhattan Project who really believes communism is the wave of the future. And then once he's been found out and is disillusioned, kind of repents that, yeah, I was a young, dumb kid. So they kind of feel bad for him. But he does, he does do hard time. I mean, so you know, he does, he does pay, his, pay his price. I like the name of your book, and it, it makes me wonder if in the next edition of your book you have another chapter on the Russian uh, espionage game plan related to a golf club in Florida that had <laughs> classified and top secret information. Do you think that will be a chapter in your book, next book? <laughs> if, if the publisher wants it, we'll see. <laughs> Give me 20 years plus, and then we'll, yeah, the, the, yeah. But and that, writing this, uh, my original plan was to stop in 90, and, and the publisher was like, no, no, come on, and this is, I don't know, about five years ago, right, as like the Murphy stuff, so there was, in the elections, like, you got to take it to the day, and as a historian, it's kind of hard to do that, right, but you can kind of, you know, what was going on in the present time was they were finding Soviet agents in the U.S. again, or, I'm sorry, Russian agents, old habits die hard, um, and it was just this nice parallel which convinced me, yeah, you probably need to talk contemporary, which is why it kind of comes to the 21st century. And with, again, with Putin in charge, it's even more unique because he's kind of in a drop-off like character, right? So yeah, but it's just hard to find good information because no one wants to admit what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Sir? Um, you talked about the U.S. leaning more on technology, less on people. Mm-hmm. Could you comment, in today's, you know, we read the the newspapers today and you see the U.S. reporting what the Soviets are going to do maybe before they're going to do it, or the Russians, do you think it's still, we're still technology? I think Technology so. or human? I, I think so, but I mean, one of the benefits you have now is Ukraine, right? So you can get folks into Ukraine and see equipment and things. So signals, intelligence, and technical means uh, are, are phenomenal. I mean, if you just look at the access to kind of, you know, what you can find out about satellite imagery, or signals intelligence, what they could do in the 50s is kind of what they could do today. So in the 50s, you can see a picture from Corona, and it's, you know, you can see an airstrip with maybe some fuzzy aircraft on it, whereas today they can get down to, you know, the declassified stuff tells you about a license plate, which I'm sure it's even better than that. So um, it's still hard to fly over a country, right, and take pictures, but you can fly over with a satellite and do it because, yeah. And that's, Sputnik's unique in the fact that it, the Eisenhower administration is pushing for um, open skies treaty as a way to kind of decrease tension, and the Soviets don't want it simply because they, they, they want, don't want us to know they don't have as much as they think they, we think they do. But Sputnik, the Eisenhower administration doesn't protest Sputnik flying over the United States because they're like, oh, guess what? We can fly our Corona satellite over the Soviet Union because it's just a satellite, right? No one owns space, and it helps. So that kind of propels the whole system that, I don't know, technical means, satellites are a really good means to kind of collect intelligence because nobody owns space. And if you sign off on the Outer Space Treaty, you know, we're just doing it for military purposes. It's not, it's not offensive. It's not weaponization. It's just to keep things cool. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, you talked about how the spy game changed both in the U.S. and the, and the Soviet side. What did you see that stayed the same throughout the period for both? The, the unquenchable obsession with the need for more, which is unique. I mean, they can never get enough information, which I think drives them to do all these you know, crazy ideas. Um, and I'm sure that's still the same today, right? Because, I mean, in the Cold War, that nuclear tension and, and the need to know what your enemy was thinking, I think, drove that, that you want to, you know, okay, how close are they to nuclear war? And that's... 
I really like the chapter on, on 83 and Operation Ryan because um, uh, and drop off is, is obsessed with this first strike, and he just can't get enough information. Like, you know, okay, so you got the Domino's pizza delivery roster for the Pentagon. All right, what about, you know, the air base out at Andrews? What are they getting? So it's, it's just more and more and more. And, and what you see is on the KGB side and the GRU side, the system's straining under the demand for more. Because I need to get, you know, I need as much information as I can. So if I have to launch a preemptive strike, I know it's going to happen. Versus, no, nah, I'm about 50-50 of the way there. Oh, let's just, let's just, you know, roll the dice and go. So that, I think, always stays the same. And I don't think it's ever going to go away. Good question. Uh, Sean, I uh, enjoyed your presentation very much. Uh, I have a question about the last, uh, uh, updating all this a little bit, uh, uh, about the last 20 years. Uh, having to do with the role of uh, China. And the question is whether you see China moving into the void and adopting some of the uh, ambitious, mi ambitious missions and uh, methods of the, uh, of the uh, erstwhile uh, KGB, those methods being human, SIGINT, and uh, now also uh, CyberInt. Uh, uh, I recall that about 15 years ago, the uh, Chinese communist uh, penetrated the uh, uh, personnel files of the Office of Personnel Management and uh, absorbed every detail of the files on two million federal uh, workers, uh, which sort of puts the old KGB puttering around uh, 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 Long Beach to shame. <laughs> anyway, that's the question. Yeah, no, in fact, I was involved in that <laughs> stealing of that data. Um, I had, had to renew my security clearance, and I about a, a three months after I got it, Got a note saying, hey, by the way, all your information was stolen by the Chinese, so you have, yeah. Um, I think so. And again, that quest for more information, right? And, and I don't know a whole lot about the Chinese espionage situation, but they seem to be following a similar path. Uh, they seem to be much better with technical means, i.e. cyber. Uh, they seem to be very good at using front companies, too, um, amateur-like, right? Or, hey, let's go buy a, you know, we'll step in and buy some ports in Greece, and all of a sudden, you know, Greece, the companies default, and all of a sudden the Chinese government steps in. So they're, I think, much more shrew and much more focused on what they want to do. And, and in some ways, maybe better at it. Good question. I think we're good, right? So that was the last question. Hey, I truly appreciate my first time back at the Dole since COVID. So it's been fantastic. Thank you for sharing an uh, afternoon with me. And if you have more questions or comments, I can stick around and ask and talk about the 80s or 90s. So thank you. Have a great afternoon.